I was reading Genesis and thinking about uh, the story of Adam and Eve and and how this applies to psychotherapy. I was speaking in, in a previous video about the fantasy bond. Yeah, so a fantasy bond, it's a somebody has gone through trauma or had a bad relationship with their parents or no relationship with their parents or there is a relationship with their parents but emotionally they're emotionally unavailable or they don't connect in the way that that they should and um, so in in their own mind the child has like an idealized image of the parent as either all powerful or punishing uh, domineering, almost their identity becomes aligned with that parent and they're stuck in this this imaginary bond where there's actually in reality nothing of that sort, it's, it's a defense, it's a way of keeping yourself safe by uh, fantasizing about things that you are doing in relation to this connection that it's established and that you are able to um, to, to function in a close proxy with the parent but it's it's just a proxy it's an imaginary bond and people can have this as well for fiction and imaginary like I would say a fantasy bond definitely applies to the female relationship with the animus uh, Jung's concept of the animus is a almost like a male spirit or a male archetype inside of a, a female and uh, I think that appears as, as an idealized as an idealized image of what a man is and some I think teenage girls especially can have an animus which is is dangerous because you're they will be in a fantasy bond with this idealized image of what a man is and not establishing real relationships with men and yes establishing in the modern world establishing relationships with, with real men is very very difficult especially as a young woman living alone with parents as well you know there's no real like women aren't seen as women anymore, so we're not really defended, we are not given advice on how to deal with our sexuality or how to deal with male attention, we're not given advice on safety, and I don't mean safety in terms of walking down the street at night and something happening to you, I mean safety more in, in a psychological way, because if you live alone, your body is constantly on defence mode, because you are looking out for yourself, and you basically become your own man. Um, and you don't really have a strong father figure around and you don't really have strong male figures protecting you it's very much like a free-for-all and it's terrifying and it's difficult and and I think also if in the absence of an emotional connection from a father or an emotional connection from parents in a meaningful educational way because there can be a connection a fantasy bond isn't just formed by having abusive parents it can be formed by they're not providing the right thing, or they don't know how to advise you, or they don't know how to be there, or they're scared of you, or they they just can't provide what you need in some way, or, or they are un insensitive in some ways. Um, and it just builds up over a long period of time in which you sort of retreat into your own inner world and your own inner fantasy. Yeah, the fantasy bond I think people can have with their animus, and I think you see it a lot in people who say they are asexual. I don't believe asexuality is a thing. I think fear of intimacy is a thing, and I have sympathy for that. It's something that should be interrogated. I don't think it's a, I don't think it's the point that you stop at. Yeah, some people, you know, that they that they will say they're asexual and they have a very strong male figure in their minds that they are attached to. You see, with teenage girls also trying to become this male figure in a way where they find safety or they find a stronger sense of self because they don't know how to determine them themselves, they don't feel like a real person, a living person, perhaps because there's no adventure they have to perform their lives to, to justify it in some way, it's almost like a stage set. But I, th I feel like the fantasy bond is, um, yeah, it involves perhaps asexuality, I mean it's what Robert Firestone writes as well, that there is a degree of asexuality because to maintain this fantasy connection with the parents, um, men or women will struggle to establish meaningful relationships with the opposite sex because in their own mind they're trying to keep all of these mechanisms, all of these defences intact so they don't want to involve with um, with somebody in a way where there is a loss of a sense of self or a loss of an established sense of self which is you in a weak position in relation to the parent and then you carry that into relations with others where you're in a weak relation to the other and then to transgress 
your boundary and to transgress this fantasy which you have in your head which is uh, idealised things which you are doing which identify you with your parents and idealised things which you are doing which, I which identify you with an idealised same or opposite sex character in your head. Um, the, it, you know, having a relationship with another person necessarily demolishes this and it's one of the Ten Commandments which you should not worship idols and I, I remember uh, discussing this very much in depth with a priest when I was being baptised because, or before I was baptised obviously, you know, I wasn't reading the Ten Commandments as water was poured over my head. You know, let's throw in some, f some fanfic style terminology uh, Victor Hugo, to love another person is to see the face of God. If you love another person and if you love God, I don't know, you're just carrying that love through and you're really like appreciating the world as it has been created or the other person as an individual soul, as a spirit, as a... And you don't have to believe in God to view people in this way. I certainly, I wouldn't have said I believed in God. Uh, or I would have, but I didn't know how to explain any of this stuff. But, you know, to see an individual person and to really try in your best way to love this person and to love what is rather than to, you know, to erect fantasies and I think, so that's, yeah, the idol thing, um, but yeah, just thinking of this asexuality, this, you know, refusing to really involve intimately with others or to be unable to have an active sex life or an active romantic life or emotional life at all uh, in terms of the fantasy bond, and let's actually look at some of the fantasy bond before I go to the Bible, because I think it would make more sense. She will, a woman will give up her sexuality and in emotional involvement with men to maintain a sort of fantasy tie with her mother. And you know, it's also like a self-destructive use of private, isolated time, because it's used in fantasy, or it's used in things which do not lead to progress in life, or progress for other people. Um, and again, that's a refutation of the Ten Commandments, to love thy neighbour, that's, or, you know, time alone leads to increased depression, self-hatred, lack of progress as a human being, lack of experiences with people, lack of uh, emotional integration, and so, yeah, intimacy and breaking through these fantasy bonds are really important. If you lose interest in the other, you also lose a part of yourself, because yourself is sort of kept back corrosive and, and rotting within you, it's not living in in harmony, in organic harmony with the rest of the world or with, with others. And in the fantasy bond in which you are a certain something or somebody in relation to your parents and your past relationships and or in relation to your animus and your animus is somebody for you and you are somebody for them, uh, all of this in fantasy, to, to lose that is to risk rejection and abandonment in, and criticism, but mostly this, this rejection and abandonment in the real world. But this is really, really interesting in relation to the story of Adam and Eve in the Bible. You could say that in the Garden of Eden, uh, Adam and Eve were in a sort of bacchanalian revel where they weren't conscious and then they became conscious and everything fell apart and into fragmentation. You need to go back up through that hole in faith and stillness and and trust and love. And that's just the, the small little clear point of light which we need to head towards this lack of self-consciousness, this lack of over-rationalization, this lack of um, extrapolating and relying on the world. It's a direct... is it a direct line? I don't know. It's a direct light, anyway. So, Genesis uh, 2.24 Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And this uh, interests Jordan Peterson because uh, Peterson says uh, that there is an injunction here. You know, there is something that, that is told that you must do this, this is important, this is a warning, this is a, an advice. Parents should be secondary. This, you know, this is a command that whatever has happened, which, whatever your relationship with your parents is, whatever, however that has impacted on your sense of self and your sense of what others are, or your sense of an identity in life, you're supposed to leave these bonds behind, whether in the material world or whether in your fantasy bond, and you are supposed to set out anew and create a new life and create love and create this being with others and to give to the other. This is secondary because, you know, it's, therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife and they shall become one flesh. 
and um, I liked actually uh, Peterson explains this this idea of uh, marriage being a way of establishing the initial perfection of this one flesh in the Garden of Eden, uh, perhaps going back right to the beginning for, from to before Eve was created from the rib of Adam to one being. Uh, say Adam was a hermaphrodite, which then Eve came out of, uh, which is also the idea of Plato's Symposium, that we were hermaphrodite, hermaphroditic and um, and broken apart, and then we spend the rest of our lives looking for the soulmate. Uh, very interesting concept, but it's also perhaps present in the Bible if we see Adam as initially a sort of hermaphrodite. And... Um, yeah, so to, to come back into this, this oneness, this wholeness, go back up through the aperture into the clear light of being in the, in, in the Garden of Eden, the pure revel, the Bacchanalian revel, or the, the, the lack of self-consciousness, the lack of self, the lack of... And I don't mean lack of self in having no identity in yourself, but lack of false... you know, lack of corroding within yourself in, in Luther, the idea of a sinner is somebody bent over on themselves. Let's say they're navel gazing. A navel gazer is a sinner in in uh, in, in Luther's case, right? So to be bent over the self, corroded over in on oneself, and uh, no, to look up into this aperture, to be with the other, and to to unite. And Peterson explains that in a wedding of a friend, it was the the husband and the wife underneath the the candle, and the candle is this clear light of God. It's love. It's perfection. It's purity, and they are they were each holding onto this candle and united beneath this this light and this light is what we aspire towards. The animus in a in a woman I think can become corrosive, you know, she erects this idol, this false thing and this fantasy and then rejects relations with others and this is like a blockage in a on a pathway to carrying love through the world or carrying yourself and again to say if you're an atheist, uh, existence precedes essence, okay, so your existence is cut off from traveling through the world and through life experiences and through uh, journeys and adventures because you have put this giant wooden block of an idol in front of you which is your animus, which is your idolized male, which is your fantasy, which is your asexual connection to your parents but in your mind you have this soothing figure of a fake thing which isn't real and um, whether that is the fantasy bond or whether that is the animus this is, this is, it's there to soothe you because you're in a position of danger. Modern life is terrifying. Life is terrifying. And, and if nobody is there for you, then what else, what other choice do you have other than this, this fiction? And, and fiction can be extremely useful. You know, there is so much in dreams and fantasy which can lead you to a better relation to, to who you are and who others are in the real world and where you're going. 